session of Irish History from the Hedgerow at the Irish Roots Cafe, produced by irishroots.com, with Peter Riley Adams and Michael O'Laughlin. Find a spot on the warm, sunny side of the Hedgerow now. Today's session is about to begin. They were rough, unpolished men, brilliant scholars, teaching by the side of the road, in small rooms, in nooks and crannies, wherever and whenever possible. Such men as these, they were the teachers of the hedge. When the night shall lift from Aaron's hills, twere shame if we forget one band of unsung heroes whom freedom owes a debt. When we brim high cups to brave ones then, their memory let us pledge who gathered their ragged classes behind a friendly hedge. Well, that is going to be the opening for uh, this uh, session, which is part of our really uh, uh, multiple sessions on education in Ireland and the head schools and the bardic schools and the monastic schools. And we're starting off today with the monastic schools. We just finished up with the uh, old bardic schools, which ended up in the 17th century and they stopped. Uh, The monastic schools, of course, uh, uh, began really with uh, St. Patrick's and and his coming to Ireland. Uh, which was, what, the 5th century, Peter? Yes. Uh, With that, he brought in not just the monastic schools, but he also brought in uh, Latin, which became a foundation of the, uh, really a staple of the Irish educational system. Remember also that Latin was the language, as it is today, of the church. So prayers and mass and services were all in Latin. So Latin became something very common to the ear. Well, and you know, the Bardic schools coexisted right along with the monastic schools, and then they started, they say, to uh, perhaps adopt Latin as a subject as well, which really expanded the scope of uh, what they were doing. And when uh, uh, Patrick really began the monasteries in Ireland, and it started with none other than, as we talked about in uh, earlier, Armagh. The school of Armagh was founded by Patrick in 450. So that's one more reason it became so prominent in Irish history. And that same school, there was, uh, what else was uh, formed in that century? Well, there was the uh, school of St. Enda in Aaron Moore, and there were 14 others, including the very stern school of St. Bridget. And if you went there, I think you'd remember it because uh, the tales they tell uh, would certainly build the uh, character uh, do you remember anything about the early uh, monastic uh, setup in Ireland? There were some great uh, monastic settlements. And, of course, being the monastic settlements, like so many other things, if you look even in a, in a sociological aspect, when a church was in a town, around that church grew the neighbors or grew the, the community, and the church was the center. Well, this happened in, in uh, monastic settlements, like, for instance, in the, the Clown McNeish, in Offley and Cork and Row in uh, in Kerry, uh, or rather in Clare, in Clare, excuse me, and the the beautiful settlements that are there, and they have a lot of uh, rock formations because if you've been in Ireland and seen all those rocks, well, they also use them to build uh, uh, their housing in the monasteries, and they, if you go throughout Kerry along the coast, you know, you find the beehive huts. And so those were also part of the monastic settlement. And also there's a, in uh, the Galarius Oratory, which is out uh, on Dingle Peninsula, and it was built around 800, and it's uh, believed to be a, a church building, and it's it's amazing uh, structure. It has not one bit of mortar on it, and it's as dry as could be on the inside and considering the Irish weather, and it's all built out of these rocks. And But these monastic centers where people obviously went to pray and to become uh, closer to God, it also became centers of learning. The priests were more educated than the average, and they, in some places, even become the one who was controlling the town. But priests oftentimes would go to mainland Europe, receive an education, come back, and then teach the others. They not only taught the monks, but they also taught the the average person, the peasant, the, the farm worker, the, the people who lived in the area. 
And if we take a look at uh, St. Patrick's age, so to speak, that era, we find that there were uh, 30 schools founded around the 5th century. And as early as the 6th century, they are, the Irish monastic schools uh, had students that uh, came from Europe and Britain. So there was, uh, there was a closer connection developing all the time, and that would affect the uh, educational system in Ireland. Now in 550, the year 550, They've got recorded 50 students came from uh, Lohr in France, and they landed in County Cork. And the venerable Bede wrote 100 years later about the Irish, and he said that the uh, Scots supplied foreigners with books and food and teaching gratis. And, of course, the Scots was the name that the uh, uh, in England that they called the, the Irish. The Scots served for the whole thing, the Irish and the Scots. That was an old word they used to call uh, Ireland. They just called it the Scots. They came from Scotia. And at the same time, the Irish left as missionaries from Ireland, uh, going the opposite direction. And you've got uh, Colum Kill, who went to Scotland, and Colum Binus uh, to France. And they founded well over 100 monasteries in France and Germany and Switzerland, Italy. And uh, that would con- that trend continued on, on for uh, several centuries. Uh, wouldn't you agree there, Peter? Oh, absolutely. And you mentioned uh, the saints there, uh, uh, Colum Kill and Columba. The uh, Enda, and you mentioned that as a school, uh, Enda is considered the front rank of the saints of the second order. <laughs> you know, uh, Bridget, Patrick, and Colum Kill are the main three saints for Ireland. And they call that the first order? The first order, yeah. Ah. It's, it's kind of, and, you know, saints from when? Yeah. Or what period? Or one saint? Then, if you you were the that saint student, then you might be the next saint or the other. But uh, you talk about uh, uh, Enda, who uh, then went to Aaron, Aaron Islands, and uh, Aaron became Aaron of the Saints or Aaron uh, Nohum, and uh, they said it will never be known until Judgment Day the countless hosts of saints whose relics mingle with the sacred soil of Aaron na Nohum. That there was because it was a monastery. And the, there's still the ruins there. It's kind of interesting what's happening there is that the, the because of the land and it's out in the ocean, you know, outside of Galway, it some of the land is deteriorating and falling into the sea. Right. And some of parts of the old monastery are falling into the sea. But the ruins are still there up on the hill. And you can still see them yet today. Oh, you can still go there. Sure, sure. I wonder if we'd be the last generation that might be able to see that whole building stand. You're right. Because we don't know the amount of destruction that's happening just because of the sea and the land and how far north uh, Ireland is. Well, you know, now that we've seen that these monasteries were established, what was the next big event in Irish history after uh, uh, the the time of St. Patrick? Well, we've got another lesson on that where we talk about uh, the coming of the Vikings, which culminates in the uh, Battle of Clontarf. But, well, the Danes arrived, those were the Vikings, around 795, and they would end up devastating uh, the monasteries. And many of the folks in those monasteries would flee to the continent. They'd run to Europe, and they took a lot of papers with them. And uh, I read it said that there were more manuscripts from Ireland that dated before the year 1000. Uh, there were more of those in England than there, or and the continent than there are in Ireland. And that's because of this flight uh, that the Vikings initiated uh, uh, forcing uh, some of the Irish to flee. Uh, have you heard much about that? Well, that Peter? Is, it's kind of it, it's an interesting thing, which is that they found so many of manuscripts in on the continent. But remember, then when the plague and other things hit Europe, they also went took them all back to Ireland. So you have a mixture of times of like, for instance, the book about you know how the Irish saved Western civilization. It depends about the time you're talking about, and when do we say Western civilization is being developed? Because you still have the nomads and all of that. But those things then went to Ireland and were preserved in when the monasteries had a resurgence of times. And when you go around, there's a, a, a the ruins of various monasteries in um, in uh, in uh, Kong. Uh, which is famous for the Quiet Man movie, of course. There's a monastery there, which was an Augustinian monastery. There's also one in McCroom, and there's one, uh, well, I've, talk- I've mentioned the Clan uh, uh, McNoish and uh, Corkinrow, and those are more settlements. Others just had monasteries. So you had the two things where there were larger settlements, there was also centers of learning. And when you just had the monastery, that was, um, that was of course, where the monks went. And if you have to remember, there's monastic and there's mendicant. 
a, 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 the monastic tradition is that you pray and you work within yourself in somewhat of a solitary life. In the mendicant tradition, you go out and preach and carry on, but you have the one home, which would be your monastery, or in a Benedictine tradition, the abbey. Well, and you, you can probably make a lot of good comments about, uh, because of your past experience, Peter, uh, with, uh, you know, coming along to the 13th century, we, we see that uh, the Cistercians, they rose in Ireland before the coming of the Normans, as did the uh, canons regular of uh, St. August, Augustine. And we also see mentioned real quick there, same century, uh, the 13th century, uh, uh, the Franciscans and the Carmelites. And uh, can you tell us anything about those groups, the differences there might have been? Well, of course, Cistercians are a break off of the Benedictines. So they had the rule of St. Benedict, who founded uh, his order in Italy. Um, and the, the Cistercians were more uh, monastic in their sense. They were quieter. The Dominicans were preachers, um, yet he lived, Dominic lived, and from St. Dominic, uh, he's also an Italian, were, was friends with St. Francis. And if you ever notice, the Dominicans wear a black belt on their white habit, and the Franciscans wear a white rope on their black habit. And the tradition is that a Dominic and Francis disagreed on some ways of how to spread the faith or how to live the faith. But to prove to the world that they were at least compatible with each other, they exchanged the cincture. And the Dominicans had a white one and the Franciscans had the black. And when they exchanged them, and that's why they have that today, it showed that there was, even though they disagreed in how, they were all together in, in bringing the gospel to everyone. Now, from the Augustinians, I was an Augustinian. I was an Augustinian monk, live in a monastery, and uh, St. Augustine following his rule, of, and his was uh, very basically, before all else, my brothers, love God, then your fellow men, for this is the why we are. And so that gets carried on. There's a lot of Augustinians in uh, Ireland, and a lot of Carmelites, and a lot of Dominicans, not as many Franciscans. The Franciscans' basic uh, thing today is they are in charge of all of the sites in the Holy Land. But, you know, go from ancient times or, or after the 1500s and when the uh, 1300s and when they, when they lived, those saints lived and formed their, own, uh, formed their own little orders, which was how to follow in the church. Well, as these orders uh, got settled there with the coming of the Normans, which was a pretty traumatic time uh, for the Irish. Uh, and it, it grew. It started with a, like a small invasion, a small conquering of one area. And, and it remember would spread. also, Michael, that they're coming as uh, the Normans, that um, the Franciscans and the Dominicans, they're later. But the Augustinians and the Benedictines, they're early. They're early orders in the church. The others are later orders in the church. Talking about the history of the church when they were established. Right. The, the, the Augustinian, you know, Augustine lived, uh, died in 410. Right. He's close, actually, to the years that Patrick lived. Right. And, of course, and then Benedict was in the same period of time, and in in that's the 5th century. So th they're the early fellows who started. And then the other—the Carmelites are also very old. But then uh, the uh, the younger ones would be the Dominicans and the Franciscans and, and other things, other uh, religious congregations that you hear of. Well, now we see that once these uh, organizations were set up, the Irish just swarmed to monastic education. And some of them, of course, were training for the priesthood, things like that. Others just wanted an education. Uh, so you see a law being passed in the Pale. That, of course, is the land all around Dublin there. And it outlawed uh, monastic education for the Irish in 1310 and 1380, or it severely restricted it. That last law in 1380 forced them to accept uh, any of the foreigners that applied for monastic education. So uh, you couldn't cut the, uh, the invaders out of the picture there at all. There's also a reason for why they wanted to suppress some of that in Ireland. In, we all know when the, when the British decided to, whoever they were at that time, the, you know, the, the England's uh, people from England, Henry the, the II, received the uh, bull which, from Adrian the Sixth, who permitted him to take over Ireland, so they say. Now, Adrian in history was a very interesting fellow since he was the first, the only, and the last British pope. What they were trying to do and why they were suppressing some of the monasteries is that the Irish church was becoming the Irish church and wasn't in conformity with Rome. 
So Rome said to Henry, hey, help us out here. We want you to go over there and straighten them out. Of course, he didn't do it for a long time. It took him a while before he uh, acted on the the uh, so-called request of the Pope. But it was to bring the Irish church into line, bring them in closer uniformity with Rome. Well, as these monasteries became the centers of learning in Ireland, uh, with, of course, the Bardic schools were there too, but we're looking at the monasteries now. Uh, after Henry VIII became the supreme head of the church in Ireland, you start, started to see a great suppression and destruction of monasteries then, and uh, they were not to be rebuilt. But, of course, you see there's always exceptions to the rule. The uh, uh, In County Tyrone and uh, Turconnell and Fermanagh, uh, there were uh, buildings that were still standing centuries later, despite the edict of the law. Uh, what thoughts do we have on that? Well, of course, what, what's happening then is there was the, with Henry VIII, who decided uh, he, when he wanted to divorce Catherine of Aragon uh, because she didn't give him a male heir, uh, the parliamentary boys told him, well, you should be the head of your church because the Pope told him he couldn't get a divorce because he had already received an annulment to marry Catherine who had been uh, engaged to his brother, betrothed to his brother, then his brother died. And so Henry thought, because Catherine was the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain, it was also kind of uh, royalty making sure that they were covering each other. And Rome said no to Henry. You can't now divorce Catherine. You asked to have an annulment to marry her, and now you want to divorce her. And they said no, and that's when they said, well, Henry, you ought to be the head of your own church. So that Henry's and it, there wasn't that great of it because he didn't really want to change what the church did. He just wanted to change who was in charge. Uh, that's why if you go to Anglican services or Catholic services, you have to listen very carefully to make sure which one you're at sometimes. But Henry did that because he was uh, wanting to take control over Ireland, more control over Ireland and England. Well, you know, if <clears throat> if we look closer at the 16th century, uh, we see that that school suppression still continued But there were still activities with the Dominicans, the Franciscans, and the Jesuits at that time. They just had to tread lightly, I believe. And later in that century, we see uh, schools were primarily being used for Anglo-Norman children in cities like Limerick and Kilkenny and Waterford. And uh, those schools sometimes tried to convert you if you weren't of the established religion, so to speak. Reminiscent in those towns of the Vikings also. Well, that's right. You can see that the Vikings had plowed, advanced the way, really, in many, even the Pale. uh, That area around Dublin was where the Vikings were the strongest, and uh, which really caused the Battle of Clontarf. You talk about the ports and where they they were imposing uh, the Anglican church, the English church, upon the Irish, uh, and things coming from ports. Uh, St. Paul, you know, who was from Antioch and that uh, when he went to spread the gospel, he started in a port city. Why? Because if you teach those who are coming in and out, they take what you have told with them and they bring it to another port and the ports of entry. It's not only the goods that are coming in, all sorts of ideas. And in Ireland, that's where the new ideas would come in. They'd come in where the ships could come and on those ships would be people who had different ideas and would teach you different things. And of course, that's just how the British were doing it. They're coming in the ports and then they're going to control things. But they did want to anglicize the Irish, and they did two things. They wanted to change their culture, which they never have, and they wanted to change their religion or their loyalties. Instead of being loyal to the Pope, you would be loyal to the king. And even though there were uh, some monasteries still in existence at the end of the 16th century, it was easier to go to the 20 Irish colleges that were founded on the continent. And where were they at? Well, uh, Salamanca, Lisbon, uh, Douai, Antwerp, Toulouse, Paris, Prague, Rome. Uh, uh, the Irish came well prepared when they landed there too uh, for schools like schools for the priests or for law or army or medicine. And it's common to read of uh, the teachers on the continent saying these people were well, well prepared when they came to us. They didn't have to get remedial education to bring them up to our standards. So that speaks very well of the uh, monastic education in Ireland in that century. Now, if we move to the beginning of the 17th century, we're going to see the monasteries that remain like those in Tyrone and Turconnell and uh, uh, Fermanagh. And, of course, that reminds you of the flight of the earls when O'Neill and O'Donnell left 
uh, the really the fall of the Gaelic culture and the great Irish families that existed. Uh, it's all tied in together. And if you look, go oh, say by 1618, there were still hundreds of students in the colleges from uh, Waterford, uh, Limerick, Clonmel, uh, Cork, Galway, Kilkenny, and uh, Drogheda. And uh, they get some pensions from local Irish kings and princes. That's how they were keeping some of these institutions going. Uh, not so much all the great families, but uh, really it relied on a very much of a smaller uh, support system, which later would be taken away, as we'll see. Uh, now, you take a, a fellow like Alexander Lynch in Galway. He had people coming to his school to learn from him from all over Ireland, and that included people from the Pale. And uh, those who came to conquer Ireland didn't like people drawing any support away from the Pale because that was their territory. So the uh, commission of James I sent some folks out there to talk to Alexander Lynch, who uh, had been teaching so well that he drew all these people. And he was investigated and found that his students were quite well educated. But they took him aside and they said, uh, you know, we'll allow you to continue, but you have to convert. And, of course, he would not convert, so he was barred from teaching. And that's just an example of how this uh, how this sort of thing worked. It could go on for a while before it was caught, but if you raised your head above the average, uh, you were bound to get some unwanted uh, attention, to say the least. It's amazing at that period, you know, Henry VIII, who who, who was the, then the head of the English church as, as he was king, when Martin Luther was causing his uh, revolts in Germany, Henry wrote against Martin's action attacking the church. And for that writing, Henry was given the title, which is retained today by the monarch in England, as the defender of the faith. And then, of course, Henry decided, well, I'm so important, and I, the Pope will definitely let me have this divorce so I can move on. And that's when Henry broke. So you have a very interesting thing. It was politics uh, and which then became, well, we can't have anybody loyal to the Pope. They should be loyal to the monarch. Well, and if you take a look at some of the Commonwealth records uh, when all this was coming down, uh, Popish schoolmasters were to be sent to the province of Connaught or to the uh, Barbados Islands, and uh, that wasn't a pleasant thought. I don't know how many actually got exiled like that. But Charles II came along, and they say he made things just a little bit better for the Irish. Uh, not a whole lot if you were an Irishman, I'd think, but some better. And, you know, we find record in 1682 of a fellow named Erasmus Smith. And he had made uh, quite a bit of money on uh, uh, the transfer of land when they came into Ireland. And he endowed uh, several schools. But you find him complaining that he's losing his students to uh, the Catholic schools. Uh, which would have been a very disturbing development. Uh, maybe that's part of how the uh, invaders became more Irish than the Irish themselves. Uh, James II came along and things were better, uh, but the school buildings and the teachers had been out of use for a long time, so it would take a while to really get back into force. Now, for the first time, a Catholic university was founded in Ireland, and it wasn't in Dublin, no. It was outside of the Pale in Kilkenny, City, in Kilkenny City, and that's because it would not be likely to draw uh, students from Dublin or the north of Ireland, keeping that to the, uh, to the other side of the aisle. Uh, so it served the south of Ireland very well, and you'll see uh, Kilkenny uh, popping up several times in uh, discussions of uh, education in Ireland. There's a great castle in Kilkenny, a nice town. Um, very interesting, very hustle and bustle, and a lot of uh, thing. There was uh, students, uh, students there, a university there. Uh, when you talk about James II, remember James II was Catholic, and he was attempting to restore the monarchy to the Catholic Church. Uh, and that's, of course, when Parliament did decide that they didn't need the Catholic Church anymore. And the battle then, because he fought his son-in-law, William of Orange, who married uh, James II's daughter, Mary, William and Mary, and William of Orange, and then the Battle of the Boyne. So you have then the fight between the Catholic king and the William, who was promised the throne if he could beat James. So it was in James's time that uh, Catholicism had some support from the throne and therefore was encouraged to build and to try to rejuvenate itself. 
Well, and this is bringing us up to the time, really, of William III and the penal laws and uh, the birth of the uh, uh, hedge schools, which is what we've been aiming for all along. And, of course, it's sort of the end at the same time of the great bardic schools. Uh, I think we've uh, we've covered about everything that I can say on the monastic schools. Peter, uh, what do you think? Should we uh, end it here and then start our next lesson on the uh, 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 hedge schools themselves? We can do that. Remember, in the monastic schools, it also uh, we all have church bells. And when the bell would ring, it would give us time. time. Know what time it is. And at 6, they would have the Angelus in the morning. At noon, they would have the Angelus for the afternoon. And at 6 in the evening, they would have the Angelus again. It's the remembering to pray and put us all in a time frame. Everything was very timely in the monastery. And, you did, and bells were how you were notified. Nobody had... Uh, timepieces on them in those days. The bell was the significant, it's time for us to do, whether it be work, whether it be school, whether it be prayer. And the monastic schools also brought that in to the entire culture. This is the time. On Irish TV to this day, on the RTE station, if it's noon, they say the Angelus on television. That's hard to believe, isn't it? In In a secular world growing, it's still there. And uh, it's that it put a time to our lives and made it orderly that there's a time for one, a time for the other, time to work, time to rest, a time to pray. Well, let's let me ask you one last question that we'll end this session on. And uh, really, you're the only person I know right away that I could ask this since you have actually been in and lived the monastic life, so to speak. And you also have a great deal of knowledge on the Irish character and history and times. Why do you think the uh, monasteries, and I assume they did, they work so well in Ireland? Is there something about the Irish way of life or looking at things that would blend with uh, a monastic life, like a philosophy or a uh, a conservative or a liberal nature? Do you see anything there? It seems to me that the Irish, and it has been, of course, again, with secularism taking over, the Irish have a great awareness that God is there. And Ireland, as beautiful as it is, you know, the, the old song, Oh, a little bit of heaven, seemed to fall to earth one day. And they left it there. The angel said, let us leave it there, for it looks so pretty there. Well, the Irish have this notion. You know, there is a God, and he has to have time in our lives. And it's this whole, I mean, there's still they can tell you that nobody's going to church here, and nobody's going to church there. I was in Ireland on St. Patrick's Day, and you couldn't find a seat in the church. Yes. And they can tell you all they want. The still people, some of the younger people are not because of the, as the world changes. But you go, faith is still very important. Uh, at this time, there's, there's talk of sightings of the Blessed Mother in Donegal just this very week. And thousands of people were going. If you take knock. Thousands of people still go to knock. Yes. There is a great appreciation and an awareness of the being we call God. Well, thanks for that insight. I know I threw that question on you without warning, but uh, it'll keep you on your toes, you know, and I sure do appreciate you uh, speaking to the point. Uh, Well, that's going to do it for the uh, monastic session that we've got here on education. And, of course, the uh, next in our uh, three-part series really is the head schools themselves, and they arose out of the penal times and or the penal times. And uh, there's a whole story to be told there, and we've all got connections. I know Peter and I both have uh, connections, so uh, we're really interested to get to this one. And uh, until then, I'll be signing off. We'll be talking to you at the hedge. So ends this chapter of Irish History from the Hedgerow. The entire series is available at www.irishroots.com We have broadcast series on genealogy, song, local history, as well as original publications for every county in Ireland. The head school in Ireland was totally reliant upon the local community to survive, just as we are here today in our modern day head school. If you believe in what we are doing for your community, please do send us your support. You can sponsor a session of Irish Hedgerow History for as little as $100 and become a recognized scholar of the hedge. 
You will also receive a pass or letter of introduction from the instructors here at the school, as was the custom of the hedgerow. So keep the hedge growing with your donation, subscription, or membership. Thank you. We have been available for speaking engagements, exhibits, tours, and educational events since 1984. You can reach us at the Irish Roots Cafe on Twitter and Facebook and on our homepage at www.irishroots.com by mail at our U.S. location, the Irish Roots Cafe, Box 7575, Kansas City, Missouri, 64116. Leave a message on our phone recorder at 816-256-3360. Copyright 2009.